Hey gang, if you're watching on YouTube, give me a heads up. Let me know that you are seeing this now. According to YouTube, you should be seeing this now. And all right, uh, let's see. Waiting for a little bit of feedback here. Somebody let me know. And we seeing this on YouTube. You should be getting it. YouTube says it's good. So for those of you, Lawrence, you came here from Facebook. Awesome. For those of you that were watching on Facebook, I'm sorry. I don't know where things went south. Gang, again, do some typing. YouTube, okay, thank you. All right, listen, um, that happens. I tried out some new technology so that we could hopefully get this out on YouTube and Facebook tonight, and guess what? YouTube did not like that piece of technology. So that piece of technology is done for tonight. We're gonna bypass it. And we're going straight into YouTube. It's all good. So, gang, we are back with the last frame. First of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank you for uh, all the great feedback that I got last week regarding the format change and everything. So in case you weren't here, you now have a new show for Wednesday nights. It's no longer called Talk Chat. It is called The Last Frame Live. And it's going to feel a little bit like Talk Chat because I'm here, but it's not Talk Chat. It is going to be a topic or a lesson or some type of image review every week. Some weeks, when I'm able, I will still do the Talk Chat Q&A that everybody loves. As you know, last week, I started out and I told you I was going to do 15 minutes and wound up taking the whole hour, so I had no time for Q&A. This week, we'll see how it goes. But on a lesson night like tonight, here's the big difference from the way that I do my videos and from the way that I used to do Talk Chat. No script. I'm flying blind. I literally have six items on a bullet point note that are sitting here on my screen, and that's it. So my goal, gang, is to give you information literally right out of my head. I am going to work very hard when I do these presentations to really try to put myself mentally in those scenarios. Tonight, it's about eyes. So I'm going to try and put myself in my studio, working with a subject, and give you guys all of the information that I would prioritize, think about when I'm photographing eyes. So that's what we're going to do. I think we'll have some time for Q&A tonight. So by all means, type some questions in. and certainly. If your questions are about eyes, I will do everything possible to make sure that they get answered as I'm going along. And stay tuned because I do want to tell you about what's up with the Talk Chat Photography Podcast this week. Really awesome interview with some brilliant photographers, and I want to show you a little bit of their work. So, eyes. It's funny, I've actually had people say to me, what's the big deal? It's eyes. Everybody's got them. Why are we worried about them? Huh, I'm not going to lie to you. As far as I'm concerned, if I'm photographing a person, and I want to be clear, I don't care if it's a close-up of a person. I don't care if it's a portrait. I don't care if it's a fashion picture, full length. I don't care if it's a street photography image where the person doesn't even know that I'm photographing them. I don't care if it's a candid. I don't care what it is. I would argue that eye placement, facial expression, those two things are probably the highest priorities when I'm putting those shots together. Higher priorities than exposure, higher priorities than composition, those two things. And the reason for that is when we talk about eyes, and it's kind of like the approach that I gave you last week for hands. Oh, and by the way, I have one more hand tip that I forgot to give you guys last week. Stay tuned for that. I'll make sure that you get that before we sign off tonight, okay? So the way that I approached hands last week was to try and discourage you from following all this crap about the rules for posing hands in the right way and the wrong way. And you know what? It's the same about eyes. There are no rules. There is, however, and this is important, please understand, while there are no rules, there is science. You can't beat the science. It's kind of like when we're using our cameras 
we've got the physics part of photography and we have the creative part of photography. Physics, the relationships between shutter speed, aperture, ISO, the inverse square law, depth of field, all of those things, you can't fight that. You embrace those and you use them as tools. So when we're talking about humans and eyes, there are no rules, but there is some science. So that right out of the box is probably the biggest set of reasons why eyes are so important to me. But I find, and this is my opinion, I can't give you science to back up this statement, but I think most of you will agree. The right facial expression, the right placement of the eyes, that combination, that'll make up for a less than great pose any day because that's where people's attention is generally going to go. And when I say it will make up for a less than great pose, I mean when the average person is looking at it, not a whole bunch of people with cameras that love to pick you know, pictures apart, right? Okay. Uh, I can also promise you, and this does come from my own experience and also from many, many conversations with very, very successful photographers. I can also promise you that if your business model, if you're trying to make money as a photographer, if it relies on print sales, which by the way, if you're a portrait or a wedding photographer and you are not relying on print sales, you're missing out. You just are. But if your business model relies on print sales, putting all this additional effort into the eyes and the facial expressions that go with the eyes, it will have a dramatically positive impact on your print sales and on your income. So for me, I kind of have a, a simple analogy about the eyes and and how I approach the eyes. And it really has to do with the idea of fantasy. So keep in mind, you guys know, the majority of my photography is photographing beautiful women. Not exclusively, but most of it. So that being said, any of these images, I have this luxury of being able to have that woman, that beautiful woman, square in my viewfinder. And essentially, it is any guy's fantasy, but I don't care if you're a woman photographing a man. I don't care what your preferences are. As you're photographing this person, it's about creating a connection. And by the way, when I say connection, even if the person's not looking directly at the camera, it's still about creating a connection. And I'm going to show you some images so that I can make my point and help you understand what I'm trying to get across here. So for me, that's really... That's the basis of all of it. I am trying to build a relationship, not the relationship that we need to build with our subjects in order to put them at ease, in order to give them directions, but a relationship with the camera, a relationship with the idea, a relationship with the image, the concept that I'm trying to put together. Now, all of that that I just told you I've been doing that for decades, but I can tell you that there's actually science that, that supports the value of doing what I do and actually supports my reasons for doing it. So this is one of those ones where I wasn't really that smart, but I got lucky. The science says, Joe, you're doing it right. There is a chemical in our brains. It's called oxytocin. Oxytocin is produced by the hypothalamus of our brain. It's a hormone, so it's produced as a, as a response. And it has the power to regulate and manipulate our emotional responses. Which means things like trust, empathy, gaze, uh, positive memories, processing of bonding hues, and positive communication. That all comes from oxytocin. Give you a great example for those of you that are pet owners, especially if you're dog owners. If you stare into your dog's eyes and they stare back at you, both you and your dog get a hit of oxytocin. 
and it further strengthens that bond between you and your dog. So the fact of the matter is humans are wired to place this value on eye contact. Obviously, if you're in a relationship, again, I don't care if you're male, female, I don't care what your sexual preference is or how you identify. If you have a partner, the idea of staring into each other's eyes releases oxytocin, strengthens the bond. It creates moments that we all enjoy, often leading to other moments, right? But it is very powerful. So as a photographer, as I've explained to you many, many times before, when you finish an image, so I'm kind of jumping ahead to the end here for a second. When you finish an image and you release it to the world, whether that means giving it to your partner, whether it means showing it to a friend, posting it in a Facebook group, putting it in a gallery, doesn't matter. When you give it to the world, you have to let other people have their experience with the image. You don't get to tell them this is what their experience should be. You don't get to tell them what they should feel or what they should think. And trust me, many photographers and artists do that with really not a very successful outcome. I personally have the mentality, if you have to explain your picture to me, one, either you're very insecure or two, the image just is not very good, that it's necessary for you to explain it. You have to let it go. But the more that we understand these little tricks, the more that we understand, shall we say, science, we can use those as tools, just like we would use the right kind of light or a reflector or the right lens. We can use these elements of science as tools to help us have an impact. Since we can't really control the response, we can impact the response. We can kind of push in the right direction for the kind of response that we want. That's why these things matter. And again, I'm not saying that you have to take every picture with your subject staring right down the lens. You'll see, I do that a lot. I love that. That's kind of a thing for me, but that's not actually what I'm suggesting that you do. So there's a few things that I want to show you in terms of some, I don't want to say rules and I definitely don't want to say guidelines. I don't want to say either one of those, but I guess some tips that I use with regards to eyes that are kind of part of my workflow anytime I am going to photograph someone, right? Anytime. So the first one that I want to show you here is I've got just a couple slides. These are from um, the, pre whoops, wrong picture there. Still the wrong picture there. Let's try this one more time. I'm sorry, gang. I completely hit the wrong box. So let's just come down to here and we're going to hit that one. There it is. Okay. So I want you to look at where the subject's eyes are. Now I'm going to forewarn all of you. Um, the images you're about to see here, it's a little eerie only because her face is never going to move, right? So I've, I've created part of this with Photoshop to illustrate the point. So it's just the eyes. All you got to do is pay attention to the eyes. So in this particular scenario, she's looking straight ahead. Now, as I change the screen, you'll see the eyes move to different locations. In other words, her looking in different directions. And you have seen images like all of these that I'm about to show you. You've probably taken images like these that I'm about to show you. But I want you to just allow yourself to kind of feel the connection or the impact that you get from the eyes in each of the various scenarios. So in this first one, of course, she's looking straight ahead, right into the camera lens. So there is a very direct connection. The pupils are centered in the eyes. But then we're going to start to move around a little bit here. And you notice the minute she's looking off only just a little bit, but the minute we start to move the gaze to a different location, 
we start to lose the connection. We start to lose the impact. And again, just so you don't turn me off yet, I'm not suggesting or making the statement that you have to have your subject looking at your camera for every picture. Bear with me. We're almost there. I'm going to show you examples not looking at the camera, but the same concepts apply. So again, as the eyes look around, we lose that connection. Now, certainly, we'll go back to this one, actually, for just a second. We see pictures like that where it could be a scenario where the person's like looking like what's coming. You know, there's any number of exceptions, but those exceptions should be purposeful. If we're doing a picture, a portrait, a modeling picture, where the goal is to show this person as an attractive human, to have some kind of a connection, to influence the viewer to think that this person is attractive and beautiful, that's where the science of the connection becomes extremely important. And this is why for so many of you who work with amateur subjects, specifically models, those of you that do the model mayhem and the purple port and you find your models on Instagram and all that, you have to understand that many of these young women try extreme, and they're beautiful, but they try extremely hard to work for you to create good pictures. They don't want bad pictures. Not a single one of those women or men for that matter shows up in front of your camera because they want a bad photograph. They just don't. So the problem of it is, though, they haven't necessarily had the best teachers because they have been working with amateur photographers. Amateur photographers who thought that the right way to do it was like in the movies. Stand back, pick up the camera, and tell the model, go, and then just watch her and take pictures. And then, of course, they want to be encouraging. So regardless of what the model's doing, they're like, oh, yeah, that's great. Oh, you're awesome. Good, bad, it. Good, wonderful. And we're not getting good pictures that way, right? So when the eyes are centered, which they're still not, notice they're back to their side. But when we come back to center and line them up, we get much better connection. So you'll hear me use this phrase a lot. You may have heard me use the phrase before, the idea of line up the eyes. Now, for those of you that are like, but I don't always want my subject looking at the camera, that's cool. Let me show you. Even when the subject is looking away. So right now, her eyes are still lined up. So what do I mean by lined up? I mean that where the nose goes, that's where the eyes go, okay? If the nose is here, the eyes go here. If the nose is here, the eyes go there. If the eyes, or excuse me, the nose is over here, the eyes go there. You will always get more impact that way. So if you watch, and again, you've all seen and probably photographed some of these examples as the eyes move around, we immediately, just from there to there, we immediately lose impact and connection. Now, again, we get to this kind of thing. It could be what's going on. I'm afraid. There's any number of special reasons for this. But if the goal is to show a beautiful person and have the viewer of the image look at that person the same way, you get more impact when the eyes are in the center. So these are all variations that we see, but the eyes in the center are much, much stronger. So I want to give you some examples, uh, some, shall we say, real life examples, okay? So let me just readjust my screen here and we'll go ahead and show you a, a couple different things. Let me... Let me find my sideways shots here. They're the yellow ones. Okay. So I'm going to start out. We're going to work backwards a little bit. And these are all shots. These ones that I'm going to put up on the screen are all images where the subject is not looking at the camera or has their head turned and is maybe glancing towards the camera because I'll show you how I handle that, right? But in these situations, subject is not looking towards the camera but the eyes are looking straight out over the nose. So really what I'm trying to get at, and you can kind of see it in this shot or even maybe better yet in this shot. If you pay close attention to the pupils of her eyes, you can tell that the pupils of her eyes are still 
centered in the socket, meaning there is balance, right? If we saw more of the pupil, it would mean that she was looking to the side. In other words, you know, nose this way, eyes this way. If we saw less, it would mean that she's got her nose here and her pupils are back. And gang, I'll tell you how that happens a lot. And a lot of you probably have images like that. You're the photographer. I'm your subject. If you just tell your subject, hey, turn to the side, what frequently happens is, and I'm going to show you. So imagine the photographer's over there. You say, hey, just turn to the side. The model goes like this and stops. But the eyes, instead of being straight ahead, wind up over here. So you can see as you look at me, my pupils are shoved into the corners and you're getting a lot of extra white space. So you don't have the impact that you want from the eyes. And trust me, you, you can't do that like where you say to your subject, okay, turn that way and look that way and then tell your subject, now make sure you line up your eyes. Because I'm sure the first time you guys heard me say, line up your eyes, a lot of you were like, what do you mean line up the eyes? I never tell my subject, line up your eyes. I never tell my subject, look over your nose. That's a great way to get your subject to be like cross-eyed, like what? No, I will tell my subject where I want them to look. So in my studio, if my subject is sitting here, I'll tell them to turn and look at an object that is mounted on the wall in that direction. Or I will literally walk in that direction, looking at their face and their eyes until I have the eyes the height that I want. And then I will say, okay, pick something right behind my fingers. Okay, so you know, I'll hold my hand out. Pick something right behind my fingers because I'm gonna move my hand. Okay, cool, stay right there and then I'll walk back and I'll do my shot. So I'm always going to be very specific because when you give general directions about the eyes, you have to remember, you see the eyes. You see the impact the eyes are having on the picture. Your subject, I don't care if it's a portrait subject. I don't care if it's a model. I don't care what the context of the picture is. They have no clue. And this is not one of those things that comes down to how experienced a model is your subject. Not at all. They have no clue. So if you want as much impact as possible, you have to give your subject those specific directions. So uh, again, you know, in all these images, you'll notice the subject is not looking directly at the camera, but the pupils are centered in the eye sockets. So there is balance on either side of the pupils. In this case, Look close, I cheated ever so slightly here. This one, she is looking slightly to her left. That's why we're seeing quite so much of the pupil. Now, when I say looking slightly to her left, there's actually two things going on. So she's got her hands like this. Imagine, you know, camera's over there. So we're doing it from the side. I had her cheat on this picture. She's turned her head ever so slightly, like literally barely. And then even just a little bit more, instead of looking right out over the nose, her eyes are kind of like to about here. She cheated ever so slightly. But at first glance, anybody is gonna look at that picture and say, but it's a profile, right? So you get more impact, it's more interesting. But whenever possible, I am going to have those eyes centered in the eye sockets. So line up the eyes, that's, Again, rule, uh, working rule for Joe, right? You're not gonna read that in any book. But the simple science is, that's where you're getting the most impact. And there is actually a lot of eye tracking research that has been done in the cognitive psychology world where the eyes being centered and having the whites holds much more attention, draws much more attention. So there is science behind that. The second thing for me is, Understanding a person's good side. Everyone has a good side when it comes to photographs. Now, the challenge is, is that a subjective thing or what defines that? So I do wanna let you know that in the description below this video, you can check this out later, 
I have a few videos linked that I've done in the past. One is about finding the good side. Another one is about catch lights that we're going to talk about in a minute. They are videos that go into a little bit more detail on some of these subtopics of eyes so that you can go and watch them and you can learn a little bit more. But I'm going to give you the overview for now, right? So when we're talking about a person's good side, we have to start with some facts. Number one, no human being is symmetrical at all, top to bottom. So it doesn't matter what, you know, what pair of body parts, but wherever we have pairs, and that's everything from eyes to corners of the mouth, to shoulders, to breasts, to hips, to knees, elbows, you name it. No human being is symmetrical. If you ever meet that person, it would be a good idea to run. Don't walk, run, because the aliens are here. It's, it's almost over at that point, right? One of the most uh, dominant traits that our brains use to determine beauty. So, you know, we think that finding something or someone beautiful is kind of just our opinion. It's influenced by many things. You know, a lot of it is simply um, taste and personality and things like that. But the fact of the matter is our brains are hardwired with certain markers that influence the way we perceive visual beauty. The most dominant marker is symmetry. The more symmetrical a person is, the more beautiful our brains automatically categorize them. Now, what that means right out of the box. Let's say you want to do beauty shots like Joe does or like a Lindsay Adler does. Working with a subject who is more symmetrical than someone else gives you a leg up in the process. So. Obviously, folks, if you're shooting a portrait, you don't necessarily get to pick the symmetry of your subject, right? You don't get to pick the disparity between the good side and the bad side. You don't get to pick. You have to work with what's there. That's why you hear us talk about the idea that all good photography is problem solving, right? But if you are setting up a shot for you, your concept, your idea, well then, of course, don't make your job any harder than it needs to be. You are going to pick, a, and this is male or female again, folks, you pick a subject who is more photogenic. And when I say more photogenic, I mean in the sense of more symmetrical. And of course, things like good skin, that requires less retouching, et cetera, et cetera, right? So going back to the good side, how do you determine the good side and where does that all come from? Basically, the good side of a person's face is the side with the smaller eye. You guys can go look in the mirror. You probably already know one eye is bigger than the other. We all have that. Unfortunately for some people, a small percentage of society, there is a dramatic difference from one side to the other. You have all either photographed that person or met that person. And it is unfortunate. I'm not making fun of anybody, but the reality of it is it's one of those feature sets in a human. Once you notice that, you can't unnotice it. It's just there, right? But the bottom line is the good side, it's the smaller eye. So if the smaller eye is this side of the face, what you would do is you would simply turn the person so that the smaller eye, is closer to the camera, right? You want the smaller eye closer. And what that does, it's basically an optical illusion. By putting the smaller eye closer to the camera, it looks bigger in relationship to the eye that is actually bigger because that eye is now further away. It balances the eyes. Now, indeed, if you want your subject to look at the camera, you've got to be careful about how far you turn. I'm not suggesting you turn real far we're going to talk about that in a second because you don't want those pupils shoved in the corner. But you put the smaller eye towards the camera. Now, you will run into all kinds of problems with that along the way. Why? Because not everybody is actually good at determining their best side. There are plenty of women walking around that have their part on the wrong side based upon the criteria that I just gave you. So then you run into a situation where, you know, this is the smaller eye, you turn them this way, 
and the hair's you know basically cut in a way that it's going to drape all over that eye and you can't get good light in there because they have a big bang and it makes it very challenging for a portrait you have got to work with the circumstances and do the best that you can for beauty shots and the types of shots that you see me do the best part of it is i work with the people that i want to work with so i'm going to make sure that that subject coming in knows that I am going to style her hair however I want it styled. So I don't really care what side they normally part their hair on. I'm going to part it where it needs to be parted for the sake of the photograph that I'm putting together. But the good side, it's real simple. Smaller side is the good side, period. One other thing that you can run into a problem with that simple process is if the person has a very crooked smile and it just happens to work against that analogy. So again, it's all about problem solving. Sometimes we have to work to kind of find a balance point. But if you are not looking for these things, you're just setting yourself up to fail. So understand that anytime I'm going to photograph somebody, when I first meet them, and even if I've just met them moments before I take their picture, I am going to make it a point while I'm having a conversation with them to study their face, to see how symmetrical are they, to see what is their jawline like, to see are there any features that I need to avoid, to see what is their good side. And that's a lot of multitasking. If that's a challenge for you, and I'm not making fun of anybody, if that's a challenge for you, when you bring that person on the set, remember, if you listen to me, when that person comes onto your set, and this could be a set in a realtor's office. I, I don't care, you know, we're using set generically. When they get in front of your camera, you should already have your lighting set up and you should already have your exposure set. If you don't, you are not doing your job. And you are making the task of doing the shoot harder because you're gonna sit there and fumble and bumble and hum and ah while you've got a subject standing there ready to be photographed. So it's a great way for you to look like you don't know what you're doing. So the subject comes on the set You've got everything ready to go. All you're going to do, if you're not able to multitask and do all that in real time while you're meeting them and talking to them beforehand, you're simply going to say, you know what? I want to do a series of test shots just so that I can get a sense of what the best camera angles are going to be for you. And then literally take some shots straight on, take some shots from the left, take some shots from the right, take some shots low, take some shots high, and then take a few moments and look through them and make your decision. Lindsay Adler actually does that. I have done demos with Lindsay at some trade show events in the past. She'll walk up to the model and she'll take a series of about 10 or 15 shots, all different spots, to find the angle that she particularly likes, and then she goes ahead and she starts working on her shot. So it doesn't matter which way you do it. If you're able to multitask and do it in a conversation, awesome. If it's easier for you and if you're able to focus better by taking a series of test shots, do a series of test shots. That's awesome too. It doesn't matter which way you do it. It just matters that you do it. It matters that when you start to shoot for real, that you know what is the best side. Are there any features that I need to be avoiding? Those kinds of things should never be allowed to pop up when you're looking in Lightroom or you're looking in a bridge and be like, oh, I didn't notice that. That's bad photography practice, period, right? And then the last thing about eyes before I break down a couple examples here is catch lights. So also in the links to the videos that are underneath this, I have some links to, uh, or a link to a video that I did on catch lights not that long ago. And I wanna be really clear, watch that video, listen to things I'm about to tell you. And if you go back and you look at some of my older images, you're gonna think like I'm feeding you a bunch of BS. So listen closely in the video because I say it and I'm gonna say it now. My personal policies, if you will, not rules, but my personal preferences with catch lights have changed over the course of my career. Now actually changed dramatically. I have done lots of images with square catch lights, rectangular catch lights, round catch lights, crazy catch lights from the DIY fluorescent strip lights that I had, all kinds of catch lights. And I still, to this day, love many of those images. And there are some 
that I no longer use because of those catch lights. Because as I've matured and as my taste has changed a little bit, I actually have a really hard time looking at those catch lights now. So I'm going to give you tonight basically the simple guideline, what I would refer to as the you can't go wrong with this guideline for catch lights. And I promise you, this guideline that I'm going to give you, it is based in the science. And again, I go into a lot of detail in that video about catch lights. The link's down below. Understand that by the age of two, yes, toddlers, that is when our brains have pretty much hardwired themselves to anticipate that light comes from above. That's why when you walk into a room, the lights are in the ceiling and not in the floor because that's what our brains expect. The sun is always up, right? So that being said, it makes the most sense if you want your catch lights to be unobtrusive, if you want your catch lights to be natural, if you want your catch lights to flatter, it makes the most sense that the catch lights should be in the top half of the eye, not in the bottom half. Plus, think about lighting now. If you have a catch light in the bottom half of your eye, that also means there's a good likelihood that you have shadows on the tops of the cheeks, tops of the nose, top of the lip, top of the collarbone. That's what they do in Hollywood when they make the zombie movies. You probably don't want your model or your portrait subject to look like a zombie. Just saying. The other thing that our brains are most expecting, and the research has found this not to be as big a distraction, but it can be, and that is that those catch lights would be round. The reason being, the sun creates a small round catch light in our eyes, period. So the sun essentially is the most natural catch light that we're going to see. So even having a subject in a room with a huge north facing window to make a huge softbox where you get the big square catch light, understand that is not a natural catch light. It's a natural light catch light, but it's not a natural catch light. So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying just understand that if you are looking for the most unobtrusive catch light, small and round and in the top half of the eye. So what I'm about to show you as examples for catch lights, for those of you that have like 20 different modifiers, round ones, square ones, gridded ones, this kind, that kind, parabolic, deep dish, shallow, you name it. I'm about to show you why you've just wasted tons of money because every single catch light I'm about to show you was either done with a shoot through umbrella, a round softbox, or there's a few rectangular softboxes. That's it three modifiers. Okay. So let me switch back here again. You saw this picture last week from the hand video, single catch light, top half of the eye, single catch light, top half of the eye. And these are round catch lights. It doesn't have to be dead center. You can see in this case, it's not dead center. The light is off center. Again, single, small catch light. The benefit also folks of having a smaller catch light is that you are not having the catch light interfere with the color of the eye and you are able to see the color of the iris. The color of the iris is also part of what makes the eye attractive, what makes that connection, right? So again, single catch light, top of the eye, single catch light, top of the eye, okay? All of these done the same way. Here's a square one. I told you there's a few square ones in here. Still small, still about the same size as the round catch lights that I'm using. Single catch light, top of the eye, single catch light. By the way, a little tip, this is in the catch light video, but um, just so that you know, if you look very, very closely, and I'm gonna blow it up just a little, yeah, you'll be able to see it. In the center of her eye, and that's actually maybe not the best side. Let's see how, yeah, this one's a little better. If you look beyond the eyelashes, you can see that there's kind of a dark gray dot in the middle of that round circle. That's because this shot was lit with a beauty dish. So the beauty dish has the metal deflector plate in the center. So it creates a shadow in the catch light, right? Uh, it's not bad. 
not a distraction. It's so small, the average person is never going to see it. Only nerdy photographers were going to notice it, right? But if you're ever trying to figure out, gosh, did they use a beauty dish or did they use a round softbox, blow that catch light up. And if you see the gray circle in the center, it's a beauty dish. If it's not, it's a softbox, okay? But again, all of these shots, single catch light, top half of the eye, overwhelmingly round. And by the way, a lot of these images that you're looking at like this shot, this shot was done with one light, one beauty dish. Like, that's it. This shot here, one light, one beauty dish. This shot, one light, one beauty dish, okay? So uh, this shot here, one light, one beauty dish. So, it, you know, so many of you get so caught up in modifiers, you think you're making your light better, but, but you're actually not. What you're doing often is you're creating distracting light. That's the thing, okay? You know, single catch light, single catch light, there's a square one, okay? Question here from, um, let me just get down to it so I can put it in the screen there. Uh, North Polar, let's get that up there. What are your thoughts about the catch lights from the GVM 600S Ring Star light behind you? So first of all, that's not the GVM. That is a specular. Um, but the bottom line is it's a star at the end of the day, right? Uh, this, this particular light, unlike the GVM, this is components. Each of those bars comes out. You can make it a square. You can make it a triangle. It comes from a company called Spiffy Gear. I actually have a video about it. Check it out. Um, for something that is meant to be a character type shot, like if I was doing like a sci-fi kind of picture, I would totally use that light and shoot through. For those of you that can't see it here, uh, this light back here, I would totally go ahead and use that light and shoot through the hole so that I got the spokes in the eyes. For a traditional portrait, my opinion, since you asked for my thoughts, my opinion is that it would be hideous, absolutely hideous. It would be terribly distracting, especially if it's a close-up picture. So again, if it's something where I can add to the image by having it here, actually, I can give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Let me, let me uncheck this. Let me find a couple shots here Oops. that I was just starting to grab a couple of them. And I, don't, I didn't get that far. So let me, let me see if I can find, I've got a few images in here where I very purposely used um, unusual catch lights, if you will. And of course, now I'm not going to find them now that we're doing this. Um, I will see if I can find them before we finish here. But if, if I can use an odd shaped catch light to kind of add something to the image, I'm all in, like totally, I'm, I'm all in for that. But I, I just don't want it to be a distraction. And I mentioned earlier how some of my older pictures where I had kind of these random shaped catch lights, how I, I just can't bring myself to like them anymore. That's why, because I've realized over time that when I did those pictures at first, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I had never done a catch like that, like that. So I thought, ooh, the catch light was kind of cool. And that's part of why I like the picture. But it was cool because I'd never done it before. Not cool because it's actually a great picture. Because when somebody looks at your photograph, I don't want the average person to look at my photograph and say, hey, like those lights in the eyes, they're cool. As far as I'm concerned, that's a statement that's just as bad as, hey, you must have a really good camera, right? I, like, that's not the kind of response that I want people to have. If I'm trying to take a picture of a woman, since I photograph women, if I'm trying to photograph a woman and I want her to look as beautiful as I am trying to create this fantasy, that's what I want people to see. And that's what I want people to respond to. Not my lighting, ever. Um, from another photographer, it's cool when they look at my picture and say, oh my God, that light is so cool. I love how subtle that rim light is. Sure, because we're lighting nerds. At least we should be lighting nerds. I'm definitely a lighting nerd. But when I show that picture to the subject or to the average person, I'm going to be devastated if they're like, hey, that light on the gin, that's really cool. That's, that's failure. I want them to look at that picture and be like, oh my God, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. She looks so incredible. That's the response that I want. 
right? And that's, again, just to, to clarify, folks, that's why I get hung up in kind of the, um, the science behind a lot of this stuff. If I can understand how the human mind responds to certain things, I can use that as a tool to essentially push a person closer to liking my picture and closer to having the response that I want them to have. It does give me more control, right? So again, catch lights are important. There is absolutely no rule that says, you know, you can't, um, you can't use catch lights that are, oh, actually here was one that I was looking for before. So here you can see, here's catch lights that are like two vertical, you know, two vertical strips, right? So they're the old DIY fluorescent lights that I had the video on that I had made, you know, for YouTube a long time ago. And for this kind of crazy, almost sci-fi look in the big eyes, it kind of looks neat, right? It kind of fits the character. But what I want those catch lights in this picture, no way. It, it, to me, it would absolutely destroy the shot. Similarly here, there's those vertical catch lights. Well, add that to the cubes that are in the headband and then the vertical eyelashes on the bottom of the eyes, it kind of fits, right? So, and, and obviously, you know, this is not meant to be a pretty picture. This is, you know, crazy makeup, crazy character, chaotic hair. So in this case, having those interesting vertical catch lights really works, right? It's something that's uh, it's a little bit different, a little bit unique. I also want to go the other extreme for a second. I don't want to show you this picture that's got no catch lights. There's barely a catch light on camera, right? If you look close, there's no catch light. But unfortunately, here's a very beautiful woman, but look how dead the eyes look. So not her fault. This is, this is a Joe fail, right? This was a test shot that I did thinking I had my lighting all set up and then realized in order to finish the shoot, I had to lower them, okay? Uh, but this is a great example of why catch lights are important. Now, you can get away without catch lights, but you need to see some color. You need to see some detail. So this is an African-American woman with very dark eyes, no catch light, and as a result, the eyes are just kind of dead. So it's important to have those catch lights. Um, similarly, I was talking about catch lights that are different or odd. So, you know, here's a clown picture, which many of you have seen. So obviously this is a clamshell lighting setup. I've got a beauty dish up top and you can see the big round disc on the top, but then I've got a smaller beauty dish on the bottom. So I'm creating this clamshell light with, with two lights. If this were a portrait, having that bright bottom disc would be very distracting. But given that it's a picture, number one of a clown, number two, a clown with all the circles, this is just adding another circle in to the shot, right? One other thing that I want you to also be aware of, if you are photographing a person that has beautiful bright blue eyes, as an example, do not work in a dark room because the pupils are going to open up and there will be less blue to be seen. Make sure you turn some lights on or turn your modeling light up so that the pupils constrict. The more the pupils constrict, the more blue there is for your photograph. Uh, similarly, since we were doing the clown, you know, here I had my light. I rarely take my light way high over the head. So my light was pretty much almost directly above her. And I barely got catch lights at the top. But in order to give this kind of an eerie feel, I have a light down at the bottom. Actually, it's a reflector, but it's, it's lined up so that it's bright enough. And it's creating that bottom catch light, which is distracting. It's unusual. And I will say this, you now have seen two pictures with the bottom catch lights, one from a reflector, which is this one, one from a beauty dish, which was the last one. And I just want you to notice how distracting those bottom catch lights are. So many of you, Adam, thank you so much for the super chat. I really, really appreciate it. So many of you, when you, um, when you do this, and by the way, John Edward, thank you for the super chat. I did see it earlier and I apologize. I went right past it. Um, when you have a reflector at the bottom or when you have a second light at the bottom, you don't want that to become what the eyes grab onto. So you want to make sure that it's subtle, that it's turned down. Really, really important. That bottom light should be an accent. It should be a fill. 
But the mistake so many photographers make when they add that reflector on the bottom or when they add the light underneath, what they're paying attention to is how bright is it here? And they're looking at the neck. You know, are there shadows on the collarbones? Is the bottom light too bright? So it's creating shadows in the wrong places. And they don't look at the catch lights. A great example, this came up in a conversation in my mentoring group this week. A lot of you like those Westcott highlighters, the curved silver, you know, reflectors underneath. Those things are horrible, man. They're absolutely horrible. Number one, they're actually incredibly challenging to use. And number two, most photographers, when I see them use them, they put that highlighter right underneath the subject, like literally right here, okay? That's not how it's designed to be used. It's designed to be used out away from the subject, a long way, actually three to four feet away, so that it's putting subtle highlights into the bottom portion of the eye, not bright white highlights. Again, in most cases, the first time somebody buys one of those and does it, they're like, oh, that's really cool because it's jarring. But the fact of the matter is it's only cool for three minutes. It's actually a distraction to anybody else that looks at the picture. That's the challenge. Okay. All right. So I am coming up on four minutes and I promise you guys two other pieces of information. So I want to do that first of all. And if you have any other questions about hands, number one, um, feel free to post them in the comments below and I will answer them. Keep in mind, I can't answer the chat as soon as the video ends. So, uh, and by the way, if you haven't like uh, checked in, please do so that it's in the chat. And I know you're here. Uh, and for those of you that are watching, you know, like a day from now, a week from now, whatever, check in in the comments below. Let me know you watched the video. It's always cool to see who's watching. So please do that. So we're done with the eyes. We're going to go back to hands for one second because I forgot an important hand tip. Last week, um, I mentioned it really, really, really fast, but but I want to I wanna take just a few seconds with it. Um, actually, I didn't mention it. I'm sorry. It was in my Facebook group I mentioned it. See, I talk too much and then I forget where I said it. Any woman over the age of 25, any male over the age of 30, but guys don't care as much, right? So this is really about women. If you are doing a full-length picture or a three-quarter length picture, remember, we're talking about hands now, and their hands are down at their sides, understand that the skin on the back of the hand, for male and female, this skin is very thin. That's why when you get to be old, kind of like I am, you can see the veins really easy, right? They're like right there, okay? For a woman, when she's got her hands down at her side, all those veins become buckets of blood. The blood is just pooling in her hands. So as the veins fill up, they get bigger. Then you light them with light coming across the hand and you create shadows and you make her hands look older and rougher. No woman will like that. And folks, don't take my word for it. I'm some guy you're watching on YouTube. Why would you take my word? You can do it yourself. Hold your hand down at your side for five minutes, right? Let it pull, and then just bring it up in front of you and just watch the veins empty out. You'll see it, okay? And you'll see how the bumps smooth out. So. If you're doing a series with a portrait subject or a model and they've got their hands down at their side or even their hands on their hips, but if the hands aren't up, but they're in the picture, only go for a minute or two at the most and then take a break and have them hold their hands up to drain the blood and then go back to the pose. Unless you are willing to do a lot of retouching but you do not want to give a woman, especially a young girl in her 20s, you do not want to give her a picture where her hands look like she's 40 years old. She will not like you for that. And she's certainly not going to order extra prints, period, right? That's not going to happen. So super, super important. Keep the blood out of the hands. I forgot to tell you that one last week. So hopefully if you were here last week, you can that tonight, you'll be good to go. So the Talk Chat Photography Podcast, it is out. It is available for you guys to watch. You can visit my website. Um, gosh, it would help if I had that a little smaller than you could actually see it. There it is, okay? Um, it is the first one here. I am gonna grab the link for you. My guess this week is another couple. Um, these two photographers 
are from Atlanta, Georgia. They are just absolutely amazing. Their names are Regis and Karen Bethencourt. Their business name is Creative Soul Photography. And their work, uh, especially since you guys are following me, believe me, you want to check out their work. Their work is just to die for. So I'm going to try and let me get to a page here where I can show you a bunch of their pictures. And I want you to go check these out. When you uh, listen to the podcast, you will find the links to their website and to their galleries. Let me just scroll down and here you go. So here, here is a whole series of their images that are just absolutely amazing. And I want you guys to make sure that you listen, especially if you're trying to make money. If any of you are trying to make money as portrait photographers, as model photographers, any of this stuff, I want you guys to make sure that you listen to the whole interview. These sessions that they do, these sessions, they start at $2,300. So I hear so many of you routinely making comments about, I can't get enough money to be able to support myself, to do, you know, I, I can't charge the kind of rates that people say I should be charging. I talk to them about their rates. I found their starting rate on their website. I asked them, can we talk about it? Can I call you out? Can I get you to justify that? And they do. And it's the same kinds of things I've been telling you, but I want you to hear from people that are actually charging that kind of money, who are actually making that kind of money and their work. I'm not going to lie. I hate them just a little bit. Their work, it's amazing. I mean, it's just absolutely brilliant. And here's the cool part, gang. And I want you all to appreciate this. These are two young photographers who, and by the way, they're best-selling authors. They have a coffee table photography book that made the New York Times bestseller list. The book is called Glory. You'll find the links for it and everything on their site and on the talk chat page. But here's what I want you to understand. They use very simple lighting. Very simple lighting. They're Canon Explorers of Light, but they're not gearheads. You'll understand when you listen to the podcast. But here's the best part. The best part. Their work. It has a social cause behind it. It serves a purpose. It has a mission. And I've got to tell you, it's an awesome mission. I'm going to let you hear it in their words. They're going to explain it. And for those of you that may be privileged and white like me, and maybe as also a little bit older. I want you to understand that this is not actually a black or white thing. I want you, when you listen to their mission, I want you to understand that, that the real core of the mission is about little kids who essentially were being told, if you want to be a model, the way that you naturally look, and specifically with hair, is not good enough. You have to change it to make it more like a white person. Karin and Reg, they decided enough is enough. And they not only encourage these kids to embrace their natural Afro hair, but they literally have changed much of the advertising world and the modeling industry. So many of these kids that they photographed, they have also actually gotten them work with national brands. So like, just amazing. We need more of that. Honestly, I wish that I had done something like that with my photography and my career. So obviously at this point, you guys are my mission. And that being said, I'm four minutes over. Shocker. I changed the show format and I still can't finish on time. So gang, listen, um, the weather's getting nice in most places. I know we're still wrapping up a pandemic and let's face it, it's going to be a while before everything gets back to normal, but you got to pick up those cameras. You got to get out. You got to do some practicing like enough is enough, right? So you got a lot of money invested in those. You invest a lot of time. It's time to practice. So folks have a good week. Please stay safe. Take lots of pictures because your best shot, it's your next shot, gang. Adios. Take care.